Hello, it's me, Tomo Man, and today we're going to be covering the basics of x-rays, like where do x-rays come from, and what are x-rays, and we're going to cover the safety of x-rays, as well as some applications in the real world. So let's get into it. Bestowed with the brilliance of a thousand synchrotrons, he is Tomo Man. Flying through the sky at half the speed of light, he got super strength and x-ray eyes, he's Tomo Man! So, x-rays. What are x-rays? Well, I wanted to start off with talking a little bit about the history of x-rays. X-rays were first discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. He was a German physicist. And Röntgen discovered the existence of x-rays when experimenting with cathode ray 2, when he noticed the fluorescence of a screen, even when the source was blocked by an opaque object. Röntgen is shown here on the right, along with a photo that he eventually showcased the effects of this radiation with, of his wife's hand, bones and all. The source of this radiation at that time was unknown, and so the term x-rays was coined, to represent these unknown origins of this radiation. So x-rays could be thought of as just another form of electromagnetic radiation or light. X-rays have a wavelength of about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the minus 12 meters, which corresponds to frequencies uh, very high of the 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 20 hertz. You can see where X-rays fall on the electromagnetic spectrum, looking to the right of visible light just past ultraviolet radiation. So X-rays are a form of light, not much different from the light of your cell phone or the light of a red hot mocha. And with these very high frequencies, given the equation E, or energy, is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by frequency, we see that with higher frequency, we have higher energy. X-rays are so high in energy, in fact, that they possess the energy to knock electrons out of atoms, thus putting it in the category of ionizing radiation. This will be important in a bit when we talk about safety. So, X-rays are light. But where do x-rays come from? To describe this, I have two different views. First, the mechanical view, where x-rays are generated within a device called an x-ray tube. The x-ray tube, as I show right here, exists of three major components. You've got the electron source, in this case a filament, where you run a current through. You have a metal target, shown over more into the right, attached to the electrode. And you have an accelerating potential between these two points. This causes the electrons that you generate at the filament to be accelerated towards the electrode and the metal target. So the x-rays generated here, and you can see in blue where the x-rays would come out, the x-rays generated depend on the metal target that you use, whether it be tungsten or copper, as well as three major variables. One being the accelerating potential between the electron source and the target. Two being the current that generates the electrons and three being time or exposure. And to explain these three keys in x-ray production, I've got a little bit of analogy. The accelerating potential shown here with the electrons um, as penguins can be thought of as the energy that the electron has coming to the target. With the low voltage, the, the penguin or the electron is just going to find its way over to the target, but with a higher voltage, it's going to be a lot more excited to get over there. Using the similar analogy with current, you could think of at low current, we have less electrons moving towards the target, and at high current, we have a lot more, and thus we could produce more x-rays. And time is just a time that we allow this process to happen. Allowing more electrons to hit the target for a longer time gives us more x-rays. Now what if we looked at what's happening at the metal target in a more atomic view? Well, that's where we get two major forms of x-ray production in the form of characteristic emission and Brenstrahlum emission. In characteristic emission, the instant electron knocks out an inner shell electron, causing the outer shell electron to have to relax down into the inner shell. This releases energy in the form of characteristic x-ray emission. Brenstrahlum emission is when the instant electron comes into the atom and interacts with the nucleus or the electron cloud. And as it interacts with the atom, it changes trajectory 
and releases energy in the form of breaking radiation or Brennström radiation. And in our tungsten example, we can see different signals in the intensity versus energy plot for characteristic emission and Brennström emission. They're both shown here. For the characteristic, you get certain energies where you see intensity and energies where you don't. Uh, for Brennström, you see a different layout of intensities for each type of emission. And these come together to create the tungsten X-ray emission that we would see from the X-ray source. So now on to a little bit of X-ray safety. And to start that off, I will explain the tray foil. So the tray foil symbol warns individuals about the presence of ionizing radiation. It was developed in the University of California in 1946 in Berkeley Radiation Laboratory. The symbol is designed in a way where it looks like a source radiating outwards. And this ionizing radiation, as we talked about before, X-rays fall under the category of ionizing radiation. So it has the energy to knock electrons out of the atom. We don't want to interact with this too much. There are three pillars of X-ray exposure to consider with regards to safety. And these are time, distance, and shielding. Time would be reducing the amount of time that you are exposed to the ionizing radiation. Distance, because the radiation decays as a function of 1 over r squared, the further you get away from the ionizing source, the less radiation you would be exposed to. And then third is the shielding. In the case of the Nikon, it is a lead box. And so we use lead a lot in shielding for x-rays. And with these three things in mind, we can keep ourselves safe when we're working around sources of ionizing radiation. Now we can take a look at some applications of x-rays in our everyday life. Some common ones would be healthcare. So if you go to the dentist, you can get an x-ray on your teeth to look for abnormalities in the density or to see where you have some fillings. In the airport, you'd see the use of x-rays with security to make sure that you're following the rules of transport at the airport. And another cool one is in art. Uh, for instance, the Mona Lisa had a trip to the ESRF where with technique utilizing x-rays, they were able to uncover the sfumatu method of layering many variations of pigments to get a depth in the Mona Lisa's eyes. You can see that at the Louvre. And with that, I'd just like to say thanks for watching. You can check out the other lecture where we go to the ESRF and we compare different x-ray imaging tools. We'll be back again to discuss x-ray imaging and XCT in more depth and but until then you can enjoy some random XCT champs adventures see you next time